please turn in your Bibles this morning to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. If you were not able to bring your own copy of the Word of God to worship today, and I really do encourage you to do that, it's a great uh, practice to have your Bible here in worship so you can follow along as we read and as we study. Um, if you were not able to bring your Bible this morning, there is a copy of the Word of God in the pew rack before you that you can turn to. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 22. We'll read the entire psalm this morning uh, after we once again pray. <coughs> Father, we sense our, our need this morning as we come before the reading of Scripture and as we come to the preaching of your word. Uh, I pray for those that are sitting in the pew this morning. I pray for each person that is here. And I, I thank you for the group that you have, have gathered this morning. Uh, we know that you are sovereign over the entire world. And we know that there is nothing that catches you by surprise. You have ordained this day. You work all things after the counsel of your own will. Uh, you have those that are watching us by live stream right now over YouTube. And I pray for them as well that you would work in their hearts. And I pray for each individual that is sitting in these pews that you would take the word of God and that you would apply it to their hearts this morning. And I pray, Father, for the one who is standing in the pulpit. You know my weakness. You know my fears. You know everything that, that I face when I come to this time. I pray that I would fear you before I would fear any man. And that, Father, my primary concern would be accuracy when it comes to the text of Scripture, uh, to say what the Bible says without apology, and then trust you by your Spirit to apply to the human heart, to save those within the sound of my hearing that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, to lift those up within the sound of my hearing that are downcast. And, oh, Father, what a great psalm we have for the discouraged this morning and for those that are struggling with trial and difficulty in this fallen world. So grow your people in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as we read and as we study your word. We pray these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Psalm 25, beginning to read at verse 1. And notice this indeed is another psalm of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Uh, teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. His eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how Many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. 
Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I want to begin our study today, as I often do, with a question, and the question is this, what is David's uh, concern in the psalm? Uh, we've seen over and over again in the study of the Psalter that the context of each psalm is important. Sometimes the context of the psalm is given to us in the introduction or in the title to the psalm. Uh, sometimes we have to look throughout the psalm like we're going to do this morning and pick up clues as to what is on the psalmist's mind. And we have some pretty clear clues in this psalm in verses 2 and 3 and also in verse 20. Notice verses 2 and 3 again. O oh my God, in you I trust, let me not be put to shame. And then again in verse 3, indeed none who wait for you shall be put to shame. And then again in verse 20, O oh guard my soul and deliver me, let me not be put to shame. So this is the great concern of the psalm, David is concerned over this issue of shame or this issue of embarrassment. We're not aware of the specific event that may be upon David's mind, but we are aware of this specific concern that he has. Now why is David concerned in this regard? Well, there's a couple of things that we can lift out of the psalm that gives us indication what might be upon his mind. First of all, he is concerned because he has given his enemies some ammunition. Notice verse 7, Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. David reflects back upon his life like I'm sure many of us would reflect back on our lives and we would remember some things that would cause embarrassment or some things that would cause us to be ashamed before the Lord. Now, young people, this is a needed reminder for you at this point in the sermon and at this point in your life to do as Solomon commands. Remember what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes? He said, remember your creator when? In the days of your youth. In the days of your youth. We tend to think just the opposite, don't we? We think, well, we're going to live our lives as young people and we're going to, as they say, sow our wild oats and then down the road somewhere, we're going to turn and serve the Lord. Well, the counsel of Scripture is to do just the opposite. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 22, Paul told Timothy to flee the evil desires of youth. Serve the Lord now, if you are a young person. Come to Christ by faith, so that when you grow up, your enemies, those that will be opposed to you because of your Christian faith, will not have ammunition in this regard. Amen. As we recall David's life, we observe further sins that his enemies could use against him. It is uncertain whether this psalm was composed before or after his moral failures as a king. Uh, but in either case, for David, there are certain situations, whether it's the sins of his youth or some of the sins that we are aware of in his adulthood that had given his enemies ammunition. And David realizes in this regard that he is vulnerable. He understands that he has enemies. And he knows that they are on a search and destroy mission. They will drudge up anything that they can. So David is concerned about this issue of shame because he had given his enemies some ammunition. But secondly, David is concerned about shame because he knows his enemy. Notice verse 3, his enemies are wantonly treacherous or treacherous without excuse. And notice down in verse 19, consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. David's enemies are ravenous wolves. They are slinking in the shadows. They were hounding his steps, just waiting for the right moment to attack. They were diabolical. They were devious. They were devoted to David's destruction. They hated David. They hated his God. And they would wound David through any means possible. So David is facing this whole issue of shame knowing that he had given his enemies ammunition, 
and at the same time knowing something about the nature of those who opposed him. So David voices an understandable concern. He is asking God for protection from public humiliation, from shame and embarrassment. Little wonder he opens this psalm by saying, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Notice the passion here in what is going on. God, I come before you. I lift up my soul. I need your help in my circumstances. Now let me ask the question to you this morning. Should David's concern be our concern? Should we be constantly on our guard and preparing for the assault of our enemies? I've quoted the hymn before in this place that this vile world is no friend of grace to help us on to God. The opposition to biblical Christians, it is here. It has arrived in the United States of America and it is only going to get worse. And we need to be prepared and we need to be strong and we need to be aware that when we profess our faith in Christ in the fallen world, it will come with a certain amount of cost. I preached an entire, for the visitors here, an entire series of sermons a number of years ago on what it means to deny oneself and to take up the cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be prepared in this fallen world. And Psalms like this indeed do that. It shows us how to live and how to minister in a difficult day. What is the first thing that we see on the part of David? Well, the first response that we see in David to these concerns of shame and, and these concerns about his enemies, we see a humble prayer. You see that in verses 4 through 7. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Uh, teach me your paths. Verse 6, remember your mercy, O Lord and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Now, why do I call this a humble prayer? Well, I call it a humble prayer for two reasons. First of all, he prays for direction through this difficult time. What happens to us most of the times when we go through difficult days or we face persecution for our faith? The first thing that we pray for is relief. <laughs> God, get me out of this mess. Uh, that's what I pray for, and I'm sure you do as well. We want the pressure to be off of our shoulders. We want things to, to ease up a little bit. And we want God to come through and remove the trial and remove the difficulty. And that's understandable. But it's very interesting, and this is why I call this a humble prayer, because in the midst of these circumstances of shame and these concerns that David has about the circumstances that he is facing, the first thing that he prays for is direction through the difficult time. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. I think this is so instructive that David is looking at these circumstances and he's saying, Lord, I need to be instructed. I need to be taught. I need my mind schooled in the things of God. Now, I have suffered little for the gospel of Christ. It almost shames me this morning to even stand here and talk about difficulties that I have faced at times. But I can tell you one thing, when you go through trial, when you go through difficulty, this word here becomes sweeter. This word here, it becomes more real. This word, it seems like in the midst of trial, the Spirit of God comes to make it living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it goes down to the heart and it goes down to the soul. And you see your need and you see the greatness of your God. So this is a humble prayer because David does not necessarily pray for relief initially, but he prays for direction through this difficult time. But notice, secondly, this is a humble prayer because David prays for forgiveness. Notice verses 6 and 7. Now, we don't have to tell God to remember anything. He knows all things. But notice that is how it starts out. 
Uh, remember, this is just the language that the writers of Scripture use sometimes where we come before God and say, God, you have made promises here, and please remember those promises. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Now this is truly astounding if you just think about it for a moment. And this is why I say this prayer is a demonstration of humility. Because here David says concerning his enemies, Lord, they're right in some areas. I have blown it. Now we're going to get to Psalm 51 in a number of weeks or a number of months ahead where David confesses his sin with Bathsheba. And we knew that he sinned greatly on that occasion. But it's so interesting to me right here when David is just working through this issue of his enemies and working through this issue of his own sinfulness before God, he is saying concerning his enemies that they are right in some areas. They have a point. David says, I am a sinner. I have committed horrible sins as a young man, and I stand in need of your mercy. There's a verse of Scripture that says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I mean, if a friend comes to you, a Christian friend, uh, and there are some issues in your life that need to be addressed, and he will look at you eyeball to eyeball and say, Doug, you need to look at this, or Doug, you need to look at that. That is a faithful friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But have you ever thought about this one? Accurate at times are the wounds of an enemy. Sometimes your enemy will tell you things that your Christian brothers and sisters will just kind of let slide because they don't want to offend you. And I believe this is what is going on in the passage. David has the wisdom here to realize that even though his enemies are enemies, nonetheless they are looking at his, lives, his life, they are pointing out things that need to be addressed, and David is seeing how that this can be used to his advantage as his enemies identify the blind spots in his life. So David responds to this concern over shame with humble prayer. He prayed for direction and he prayed for forgiveness. But notice the second response that we see um, on the part of David to this concern about shame. In verses 8 through 15, we see David's unshakable confidence. His unshakable confidence. In spite of all these concerns that are upon his mind, his own faults, his own failures, his own sins before God, the enemies that are attacking him in a hostile way, we see bubbling up in the experience of David great confidence and great faith in the midst of the trial. He prays with assurance in the face of great difficulty and opposition. Now I want us to do something here. I want us to look back at verses 4 and 5 and then look down at verses 8 and 9 and compare David's request in his humble prayer and then his affirmation of his confidence in God. Verse 4 and 5, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And then we see his confidence that his prayer is going to be answered in verses 8 and 9 as he reflects upon his God. And he says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs the godly, or he instructs the righteous. No, his goodness is so abundant that he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right, and he teaches the humble his way. That is great confidence in prayer in this passage. Now, what did David base this confidence upon? Well, first of all, he based his confidence upon what he knew of the character of God. Good and upright is the Lord. And then verse 10, 
All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. This God that we love and serve is a God who do, does not make mistakes in this world, and he does not make mistakes in our individual lives. David is reflecting upon the character of God. Dear people, this is a man who has studied his Bible. This is a man who is schooled in Scripture. And as he has studied the Word of God, as he has absorbed his teaching, as he tells us to do in Psalm 1, meditating upon the law of the Lord day and night, now he has this vision of who his God is. And his God is filled with infinite goodness. And his God is filled with uprightness. He always does what is right and wholesome and good for his people. So David has this confidence before the Lord because he knew his God. And I must ask you this morning, do you know God? Jesus said this is eternal life to know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. We sometimes make mistakes in this realm, don't we? We think if we join the church or if we've been baptized or if we show up on church, you know, really do good and show up on church on Sunday morning, then we know God. Not necessarily so. We can do all the outward things, but miss it in the inner man and miss it in the soul. That is why Jesus Christ constantly warned his hearers about superficiality in religion. That is why he taught in parables and taught the parable of the sower. Only one of those soils produced good fruit and a good plant. Three of the four, the words go in, in one ear and out the other, or the devil comes down and steals them away. The Bible stresses that we must know the Lord so that we ourselves, not on the testimony of someone else, but because we know it personally, that we can stand up in the congregation of God's people. We can do it in the quietness of our bedroom at night. We can know that good and upright is the Lord. All of his paths are steadfast love and faithfulness. David knew of the character of God. Amen. But also he based his confidence on what he knew of the work of God in human history. Review for a moment the list of verbs that David strings together to highlight God's work in history. Verse 8, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble and teaches them. Verse 14, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. And verse 15, in this whole issue of confidence, he will pluck my feet out of the net. When the devil is sending out his net to reel me in, David says, God will come down because he is so good and he is so righteous and his covenant is so filled with promises that he will snatch me out of the net of my enemies. What is David saying? He is saying that this God of matchless character has made a name for himself in human history. This God is in the business of reaching down and saving rebels. This God is in the business of redeeming Apostle Paul's, not the self-righteous Pharisees. Now, Paul indeed was a self-righteous Pharisee, but God came and changed his heart and changed his soul. It is not the healthy that need a physician, but the sick, Jesus says. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is God's grand design in human history, choosing a people in Christ before the foundation of the world, that they may be holy and without blame before him. This God is a good God. He demonstrates his, his goodness to a fallen race. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore... He instructs sinners in the way. So David had his concerns. He considered his enemies and their attempts to shame and embarrass him. But his reasoning went something like this. God's knowledge of my sin is infinitely more perceptive than theirs. Yet based on the covenant of grace, he does not count these sins against me. Romans 8.33 who? who? Who shall bring
bring a charge against God's elect. God justifies. God declares righteous based upon the work of Christ. God unshackles the burden. God lifts the load. God casts our sins as far as east is from west. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So David possesses this unshakable confidence. And don't you just love the honesty of this psalm telling us about life as it really is in a fallen world as a child of God. All the difficulties, all the struggles, all the pains, all the heartaches. But this revelation in the same psalm of the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God to his people. And this produces this this unshakable confidence. He can face the enemy's taunts. He can deflect their errors with the simple knowledge of the character of God and his work in human history. So Christian, go out there this week. Live it. Live it. Not in your own power and not in your own strength because your strength is nothing. In fact, God says if you really want to know my power, you've got to understand your weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, the thorn in the flesh. Where Paul had brought, or God had brought Paul through that whole experience of this nagging, painful, humiliating trial. We don't even know what it is. And I believe the Spirit of God did not identify it according to design. So we could take that passage and apply it to ourselves with whatever issue we are facing in our personal lives that is similar. And Paul went through that whole experience saying, I pray, God, take it away. God, take it away. God, take it away. And guess what? God didn't take it away. But Paul said, I learned. I learned. His grace is sufficient for me. Amen. Because His power, it is made perfect in my weakness. You say, I feel weak. Good. <laughs> Good. Good. Because it will place you on your face in dependence before Him. Go out there, Christian, in your weakness and live life with confidence because of the covenant and because of what Christ has done on the cross for you. And the third response we see in this passage in verses 16 through 22 is importunate prayer. Now, what do I mean by this? We've already mentioned humble prayer. Why don't we mention prayer again? Well, I think when you go to verses 16 through 21 or 22, you see the psalmist's or David's intensity in prayer. Uh, go up several degrees. And this is importunate prayer. This refers to prayer that is urgent, persistent, or demanding. It is the refusal, listen to that, the refusal to be denied even to the point of being annoying or bothersome. And Roy read earlier that famous parable in Luke 18, the parable of the persistent widow. It says that, that she bothered the judge. And do you see what Christ is doing there for us? He's saying, go ahead. If you're a child of God, bother your father. And it goes on to say in that passage that will not the elect who cry when? One time on Sunday morning when they come to public worship? No, they, they cry day and night. The disposition of their lives is pouring out their hearts before God. Bother the Father. That is importunate prayer. And you see that in verses 16 and 5. Turn to me. Be gracious to me. I'm lonely. I'm afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble. Forgive all my sins. Consider all the foes. Do you see the intensity of this prayer? I mean, verses 4 through 7, they are rather expected, rather standard, fairly sedate. But verses 16 through 22 
take on a different tone. There is desperation, there is urgency, there is nothing casual or calm or formal here. Issues of life and death are on the line for David. The cause of God and his truth are at stake. God's glory is defaced and damaged. And something must be done. Something must be done. And the only one with the adequate power to act is God himself. You know, I think about importunate prayer. A lot of times we think of importunate prayer and the illustration I use with the persistent widow and the elect to cry out to God day and night. We tend to think of the the length of our prayers, but I think of a great prayer in Scripture. It is the prayer of Elijah that was not necessarily long, but it was importunate. You remember his prayer on Mount Carmel? I can read it to you in less than 30 seconds. When Elijah was facing the prophets of Baal, and it was all on the line. Let the God who answers by fire be God. And remember how Elijah prayed? Very simple, but very importunate. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Very simple prayer, very short. But you know what the very next verse says? You ought to. I preached a sermon series on this back in the summer. The fire fell. The fire fell. Now, sometimes in the pages of Scripture, when the fire falls, it falls in judgment, and we think of Sodom and Gomorrah. But there are other times in Scripture that when the fire falls, it is the fire of approval. It is the fire of blessing. It is the fire of God's grace that can come to difficult lives and raise them up. That can come to struggling churches and raise them up. That can come to a struggling nation and give it perspective and give it understanding about what really counts in life. And folks, we are at a point in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this nation, in our nation in the whole, that we need the fire to fall. The fire of God's blessing. The fire of God's favor. This God here, who's good. Have you discovered that? Haven't you discovered that in, the pers in your personal life? God is so good. He is so good. And he is upright. And he will instruct sinners in the way. So let us pray with, with confidence. Let us recognize we are in difficult days. There are enemies on every side, on every hand. But our God is the God of Psalm 25, who works in the midst of our, me our mess. And we were told in James 5 and verse 16 that the effectual and the fervent prayer of the righteous man, it avails much. Let us pray. Oh, Father, thank you for this psalm. And we pray, Father, in the words of Elijah, uh, that you would answer us, that you would answer us, O oh Lord, that everyone in this room, everyone within the sound of my voice would know that you are Lord, that you are God. And we pray that that message would spill out from these walls to our communities, to our schools, to our workplaces, to our nation, and to this world. Oh, Father, our world is sick right now, sick of sin. Satan has the upper hand. And we pray, oh, Father, that you would prove that he is a defeated foe. And I pray that we might see the ruling and the reigning Lord Jesus Christ coming in our own day, in our own time, to bring revival and bring renewal to your people here on earth. We pray these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn 81, O love of God. How